Hi everyone, I'm Dale Smith, aka Journo Dale, and we're here to talk about Canadian politics. All right, uh, we're here with Carleton University's Professor Jennifer Robson, and uh, figured to start off, we'll talk about what was or was not in the fall economic statement. Um, it was a pretty lean document um, as far as these things go for this particular government. Um, I, I guess um, any any thoughts off the top, first of all, just what you noticed uh, out of that? So I think, look, in general, I think uh, the, the, the big picture numbers in terms of uh, increases in, in deficit and debt came in better than had been expected. Um, and I think the overall message is like they don't have a lot of room to maneuver right there's there's mm. not a lot of space um which i mean look uh so long as we stick the soft landing maybe we all get away with it but yeah. if there is another crisis then um is there any gas left in the tank it's not clear but it just isn't right there's yeah. a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of margin there um um, but like, look, no major uh, giant uh, spending initiatives. I think it's pretty clear there's a certain amount of concern about the current trajectory looks manageable only so long as the government mm -hmm. actually sticks to it. And I think that yeah. there's, you know, there's an understandable um, degree of skepticism that they will, given Given their history. Given their history. Well, sure, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. Uh, and the fact that, let's be honest, right, we are uh, about to head into sort of the pre-election cycle. And there are certain expectations that have been expressed uh, under the supply and confidence agreement that could be extraordinarily expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so, look, there wasn't a lot new here, but it's not clear that there won't be new spending to come. Yeah. Um, um, you know, perhaps in contrast with some um, uh, uh, some who have been commenting and observing, um, I'm not quite ready to sort of set my hair on fire and say that oh God, this is this is a fiscal disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, it's I would say it's tenuous. Um, yes, the debt servicing costs have gone way up. That's interest rates. Um, so if and when those stabilize and start to come down, that picture will improve. But again, I always come back to it's not just about the aggregate volume of spending it's about what is it being directed to mm -hmm. and so look the one and only minister around that cabinet table that really got much by way of new spending was sean fraser for yeah. housing right and and um, not unexpectedly given the the situation we're in across the country absolutely absolutely right. and sort of <laughs> you know what um uh what has been very clearly uh one of the major pressures for households um especially coming out of uh out of the pandemic and the recession um but what i found really interesting actually was that the the housing announcements um were uh fairly targeted mm -hmm. um you know so it's sort of like you know the housing accelerator fund seems to be working reasonably well in terms of meeting the government's policy objectives we'll see down the road over the time what it does in terms of actual homes for people yes um so you know they did a little top up there there's you know a bit more money for this a bit more money for that um i also saw some voices uh who were i think you know understandably disappointed that this was not um an ambitious major new investment in how mm -hmm. in housing programming um, and I would, I guess I would just say, <laughs> um, these two flavors don't go together, right? You can't have sort of, uh, um, fiscal restraint, um, as well as bold new, uh, large investments in, uh, in housing, mm -hmm. um, unless you're prepared to do massive cuts someplace else. Yeah. And it does not um, seem there's much appetite for that. Yeah. And one of the things I think would be kind of up, up your particular um, alley in terms of uh, thinking about was that some of this housing funding is kind of earmarked for two years down the road. And something that I'd heard was partially because of how long the permitting process tends to be for mm -hmm. these kinds of projects. What this winds up doing is making sure that the money is more available at that point so that things can get rolling in the next year, year or two. Um, and I'm wondering if that 
sounds like reasonable kind of program delivery um, from your perspective, or um, is this just someone making an excuse? Um, okay, so I would say a couple of things on this. First of all, um, while we have some good data on um, permitting volumes, there's actually crap data. Sorry, I was going to say a really bad word, but I'll just say crap. <laughs> it's okay. Um, it's okay. Um, <laughs> it's a podcast, I guess I'm allowed. Um, okay, we have shit data uh, when it comes to um, permitting times, right? Uh, yeah. In terms of like, what's the what's the time delay from when uh, you apply to when you get approval? Um, and <laughs> Um, so I think I think that's like we're operating under the assumption that the that the gap is really at the permitting stage, and I I just think like it wouldn't it be great if we actually had some data to test that hypothesis, but we definitely know that there is a big shortage in terms of labor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all of the Build Back Better projects uh, that uh, the feds and provinces juiced up coming out of uh, sort of 2021, 2022, have really sucked up a huge amount of the demand um, for construction labor. And so, yeah, look, I think some of this is just, let's be realistic. <laughs> you don't book money in a fiscal year when you're probably not going to be able to move it. You, you know, you try and build, you try and actually book the money um, at the time that it will actually be needed. And um, I confess, I know more about sort of the government's uh, approach on general infrastructure funding mm. than I do on these particular funds that they have announced. Uh, but I suspect it probably works in a similar fashion in that um, maybe not so much half, because I think half is sort of multiple year installments over time once okay. you've got an agreement. Yeah. Um, but some of the other uh, programs, if they work at all, like general infrastructure funding, it's like you do a deal, you specify what am I paying for? And then you pay like as there are deliverables, like as there are receipts or mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm the project sponsor. We built a thing just as promised. Here are my receipts to you. Please pay me back. Right. And um, that seems to be how the federal government tends to operate with a lot of these kinds of projects. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, generally when it comes to like most of their infrastructure programming, as I said, I'm a little less familiar with the specific um parts of the cmhc funding that that got bits of uh bits of top ups mm -hmm. in the in the fuzz yeah anyway so all that to say like um is it an excuse um or is it reasonable I mean, maybe a bit of both right like on the one hand you know, um it's probably reasonable fiscal planning to book the money in a fiscal year when you can move it on the other hand uh you know like past past policy decisions have now led to bottlenecks in construction of housing mm -hmm. so here we are all right um the the other thing i wanted to ask you about was this um plan about short-term rentals and using the CRA mm. to create some kind of structure um yeah. I know our our mutual friend lindsay teds has had some uh yeah. thoughts to say about that over twitter and basically um, doesn't think this will work. Um, you, I know, had tweeted that you think it could work. So I'm just wondering if you could yeah. explain your thinking in terms of of how you think uh, this might work. Right. So again, so much of this comes down to can we build the information pipelines to the tax agency so that they can differentiate between people who are eligible and ineligible? Um for, for various tax measures. And in this mm -hmm. case, as I understand it, right, the aim is basically to geo locate on the basis of this is a subnational jurisdiction that has passed certain restrictions. And, um, you know, and to then on that geographic basis, disallow the business expenses that would be claimed against the sorry, I shouldn't say business, it may be business, right, mm -hmm. if somebody has incorporated, or it may just be like professional self employment income, right, but in any case, to disallow the expenses that uh, would normally be claimed uh, to net against the revenue coming in. Um, now, um, I don't know that the CRA currently has the information pipelines, like the plumbing in place, mm -hmm. right, that it would need to do that uh, super well. So I suspect uh, initially there may be a need to reach out, for example, to those jurisdictions that have put in place um, registration <clears throat> systems. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully you can match registration numbers with actual tax 
filer information. Okay. That's not necessarily super straightforward. <laughs> um, but if and when we get to a stage with, let's be honest, most of the short-term rentals are probably flowing through two major platforms, right? Mm -hmm. That are kind of the kind of the main yeah. mechanism for this. And so if you can get those platforms um, into the plumbing <laughs> to do third party disclosure to the tax agency, then I think actually there is a pretty straightforward path uh, to do this. Yes, there's going to need to be some sort of income tax or regulatory amendment to clarify um, that the expenses against the revenue will be disallowed for a specified code of business activity. I don't I don't actually think that that's going to be a huge problem. The problem mm -hmm. is going to be matching um, matching the properties to the people claiming the revenue. Okay. Um, but I don't I don't think it's impossible. I don't think it's impossible. All right. That's good to know. Um, all right. And we had one other thing we were going to chat about, and we had actually planned to chat about this uh, a couple of weeks ago and things intervened, but um, about the heat pump program. Yeah. Um, the government is making lots of lofty program uh, promises about um, how this is going to roll out for people. Um, but as with any government delivery, um, you're the person who I, I generally go to in terms of seeing if, is this something that um, that is reasonable or is there something that tends to be overlooked? So um, I figured we could have a very quick chat about that as well. Well, um, thank you for that compliment. I thought that you were totally going to say, uh, as with any government delivery, we know they'll find a way to make this more complicated. Um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So a couple of things. Um, so first of all, um, there's the application process, right? Yeah. And there's, sorry, there's eligibility criteria that I think are worth sort of pausing and reflecting on because you have to be an owner. Um, the, the home that you live in has to be a single family detached uh, dwelling, right? So like already mm -hmm. we're kind okay. of yeah. squeezing down the pool. And I guess, it, you know, mm -hmm. and it's because they want to target this so that it's, um, uh, the grant is only uh, one grant per household. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a home heating system that is shared by multiple, multiple households in the sense of, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, I don't know, a granny suite or it's a multi, uh, multi-unit building, um, then that's, I guess, for policy reasons that I don't understand, not something that they feel that they want to subsidize right now. Right. Again, I don't fully understand why. Um, if the goal here is to get people onto lower carbon emitting sources of home heating right anyway so so there's that issue right in terms of okay. eligibility then there's also there's the how do you apply okay so I, I i double checked the the website so here's what you need to have to be ready to apply for these programs proof of your primary residence so i presume i don't think maybe the deed or your proof of purchase or i don't know something like that yeah um and proof of ownership as well so you have to prove where you live so i guess maybe actually a bill could work but then you've also got to prove you own the place mm -hmm. you need to have copies of your heating bills for the last 12 months or 1000 liters or more of oil so like if you don't actually buy enough oil like if oil is a secondary source you don't right. qualify but you also have to have been saving all of your invoices for all of your oil deliveries for a while right you need quotes from contractors um with the price the description of the work you need something called an AHRI number for the systems that you're purchasing. Don't ask me what that stands for. I presume it has something to do with like HVAC kind of specifications or whatever. Okay. Um, and if you're getting a contractor to do, for example, the um, removal of the oil tank and another one who's actually going to do um the setup and fittings for like a geothermal system so you're using multiple people well you need documents you need documentation for everybody to apply for this thing and of course you also have to have your social insurance number so that they can verify your income with cra which means you have to have a recent tax return on file so that they can verify what is your the best estimate of your current income okay. right it gets worse okay yeah. <laughs> So not only do you need all of these documents ahead of time, right? Um, you also have to then go through an application portal. Um, and uh, they ask, 
it seems to be that there are some financial institutions that if you're registered for online banking, you can probably use that to log in. Remember during the during COVID? Yeah. yeah. That was sort of the one way that people were able to log in to the, the uh, CRA My account. Um, but otherwise, you're going to need to get yourself a GC key, which is not right. the same as your CRA My account. No, 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 no. These are these are all separate systems. Okay. All right. And then and then your application is going to get adjudicated and reviewed, right? And then, and then if you are eligible, yes, you get you get the grant, right? It gets deposited. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have to make sure that the work is completed within six months. So you've also got to time all of this for like, what is the time of year before we're into needing to have my heating system up and going? Mm-hmm. And when is a contractor actually available? Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then you've got to get your contractor to sign that they actually completed the work and you've got to put all of this in and then you've got to keep every other shred of documentation on file in case you get audited. So, I mean, this is actually a non-trivial administrative burden, right? And I get it on the one hand, they are policing in advance. It's like the department of pre-crime got to make sure that nobody gets a grant for a heat pump that doesn't deserve it or use it for a heat pump. Yeah. Um, but this has got to be a fairly major administrative disincentive for a number of people, right? Um, mm-hmm. To jump through all of these hoops. Okay. Um, and that's that's interesting. And I wonder how it would be easy, how how you could how they could simplify this without one, you know, coming into the same kind of problems they had around, you know, serve or whatever, where you yeah. had, you you had compliance issues um, in the in the long run. But I mean, look, I'm not so so the serb issue is is interesting in the sense that there just there was not up to date accurate timely data, and um, so it ran as kind of a blind system. You know, that just sort of kept mm. spitting out checks as long as people applied. Yeah. Um, and I think I think that what the government is in part running into here is that it likes to set up, for obvious reasons, it likes to set up um programs that have citizens engage directly with government, right? Like, yeah, you know, come apply for your CERB or come apply for your home heating grant. Um and I wonder, though, if and maybe maybe for good reasons, they explored this option and decided not to. Um, but there are other instances where, um, uh, you know, environmentally uh, directed programs that are meant to subsidize the cost of energy refits or subsidize purchase of certain vehicles versus others, that kind of thing, right? Like Hmm. they're meant to have a behavioral impact. Hmm. They're actually generally not delivered directly to the consumer. They're usually directed, they're delivered through a relationship with, you know, the private sector vendor who then passes on the savings to, um, uh, to the individual voter, taxpayer, consumer. Hmm. Um, Now maybe, um, maybe there just is not, um, maybe there is not a supply side infrastructure that is set up in Canada yet for heat pumps to be able to accommodate that. But it does, it does make me wonder whether that was something that could at least have been. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to, to do this and um, we'll talk again soon. Sounds great. Thanks. Again. All right. Thanks. And that's everything for this week. Join us again next week for some more Canadian politics. I'm Dale Smith. It's at journo underscore Dale on Twitter. And uh, journo Dale, no underscore on Blue Sky. And don't forget to like the video, share, subscribe, and support us on Patreon. Thanks, everyone.